Chapter 18 Pixie and I, A Hebridean Adventure Pixie and I arrived in Norton on the Isle of Harris this afternoon, and being late May the days are already long in the Outer Hebrides. The view across the Macker towards the North Harris Hills is astonishing, and the sky above and around us all pinks, blues and violets. Huge clouds float serenely on the sea breeze, forming into abstract creations in the sky, and casting dark shadows over the land. The silence is deep and feels old with hidden fairy magic, and even my city dulled ears listen without distraction. Occasionally a lone corncrake croaks his mournful call for a mate, and currently his nocturnal cries are all the talk of Norton, and apparently rumour has it some even harbour dark designs for him. Far out at sea the gannets are putting on a spectacular show, diving for their supper. For a silent hour I watch the sun setting from the beach, until it moves behind Cape Oval just being here in this sublimely beautiful place, I feel a returning of the spark of joy that has been absent from my life for too long. Cape Oval dominates the view ahead. It is just a little under 400 metres tall, but it will be akin to Chomo Lungma, goddess mother of the earth to my wee pixie. Tashi in his prime would have flown up it dragging all two legs upwards relentlessly, with no mercy, and his proud absolute disdain, always smugly evident, when I'd be forced to take a short pause to catch my breath. That will not happen with the auspicious wisdom, Pixie. The roles have been reversed, and she generally trails in my heels, and often reluctantly if there is a hill involved. When Pixie first came into my life, she used to trot in front of me, and I wrongly assumed this was because she was reasonably fit and enjoyed walking. I now realise she was just keeping the strange new human in her life at a safe distance. As the months passed, she began to trust me a little, and her pace slowed to a lazy snail plod and now it has become customary for her to drag up the rear and keep me waiting. Now little Pixie has a prodigious tail for her size, but it wags much less frequently than Tashi's, and she expresses her emotions with little warbling, whiny songs that I cannot find adequate words to describe but you really would think that she was trying to talk. She turned seven at the beginning of this year, and up to the age of six she belonged to someone else, and had four litters of puppies, the maximum allowed. The breeder then put her up for rescue, having no further economic use for her, and perhaps to avoid the vet bills her autumn and winter years might bring. I tried to turn Pixie into a mountaineer, and we've been up a few wee hills over the past year, but I can tell her heart isn't really in it, and it's becoming obvious to me that beaches are probably her thing, not mountains. I gave her the Tibetan name Yeshi, which means wisdom, but Pixie suits her more, and I mostly call her that, and if the truth be known, in terms of intelligence and practical skills, she is really the class dullard. Pixie has been a wonderful travelling companion on this trip so far. She charmed the guests in the Uig Hotel last night with her doggy antics, and she didn't bark at anyone. This morning we enjoyed a lovely misty walk in the enchanting fairy glen before catching the afternoon ferry over to Tarbot on the island of Harris. The ferry was busy with other canines and their human companions, but Pixie took it all in her stride, 
and without a single bark or acrimonious warning growl. That would not have been the case with Tashy Boy. My old ears would have been ringing with his relentless barking. Tashy was not a people person, whereas the auspicious wisdom pixie is a regular little socialite. With Tashy, I could remain splendidly aloof on a walk, but with Pixie I am regularly introduced to strangers in the park, and I have been forced to rediscover the art of making small talk. It's now well after ten at night, but there is more than enough light for our walk back to Puffin Tiny House, our delightful holiday home for the next week. I have two little boxes with me, one contains a little of Tashi's dust, and the other holds some of my mum's. I want to give mum and Tashi to the winds on the summit of Cape Oval, but I may have a problem getting Pixie up there, and I know my old legs will not carry me to the summit of many more hills. Time is running out for this old mountain boy. Our first morning in Harris is glorious and we climb up towards the little headland behind the Puffin House. Pixie doesn't find the rough hill terrain to her liking, and she discovers an isolated rock island to perch on amid the heather, and then refuses to move from it. The summit of the headland isn't much further from here, but my little lady stubbornly refuses to budge from her stony plinth, and I sit down beside her in the warm spring sunshine, and just enjoy the view. Even though we are only a hundred or so feet above the crofting village of Norton, the view is enormous and dramatic, revealing a landscape of sand, green macair, dotted with spring flowers, and huge barrier dunes, protecting the narrow strip of land that connects Northen to Cape Oval. The turquoise seas stretch out towards the horizon haze on either side of us. This is just such a perfect day. On the way back down I have to carry Pixie over the rougher ground until we reach more agreeable path terrain. This does not bode well as I doubt Cape Oval will produce easier ground. After breakfast we drive the short distance up the road to visit the white shell sands of the world famous Luscan Tyre, or Treag Rosamol as the local gales call it. The West Harris coastline has numerous stunning beaches, and the scenery is just spectacular. The habitat ranges from salt marsh, sand dunes and macchier grasslands on the exposed Atlantic coast, to rugged moorlands and peatlands in the interior. Macchier, one of Europe's rarest habitats, plays host to a stunning show of wild flowers from late May to August, which provides forage for the rare great yellow bumblebee. The surrounding seas are rich in nutrients, attracting terns, seagulls, foraging gannets, porpoises, and the occasional basking shark. If you're lucky, you might even spot an otter among the tidal pools. The final stretch to Luscan Tyre is on a single track road, which twists and turns and has several blind corners and few passing places. The view to my left is of a vast area of tidal sands stretching for miles, and it can be hard to keep your eyes on the road. Pixie has no interest in the view, and is sleeping contentedly in the back seat. We finally arrive at a small car park at the end of the road, and disembark for the short walk, to a beach that has recently been described in the Lonely Planet Guide, as one of the best in the world. The path to the beach meanders through the dunes and marum grasses next to a small stream directly beneath Bendu, which naturally I love to climb. 
but there is no chance of that with Pixie. As we draw near to the fabled sands, the dramatic mountains of North Harris come into view, and they're now much closer. Then, quite suddenly, the vast silvery white sands of Lusk and Tyre are revealed in all their bewitching majesty, and you almost feel like you're in the Caribbean. The aquamarine turquoise sea is crystal clear, and directly across from us is the now uninhabited island of Tarancy. Pixie is already rolling about in the sand, and digging holes with her little paws, and cooing to herself with happiness. Huge golden dunes run along the entire length of the beach, and are the highest in the Hebrides. They reach two hundred feet in places, and their summits are crowned with marrow grasses that dance in the breeze. Pixie is already in love with this beach, and she gaily trots its full length beside me. In places large pools of seawater have been left behind by the tide, and clouds and sky are reflected in them. This is a magical place that moves something deep inside you, and we almost have it to ourselves. When we can go no further, we rest a while in the shelter of a huge dune, and spend a silent hour just being. Dark brooding clouds start gathering over the peaks of North Harris, but it only adds to the drama of the day, and the rain squall they bring is short-lived. Lusk and Tyre has exceeded my expectations. It is a place of enchantment from another time, and already I am making plans to return to Harris for a longer stay in the autumn. Time passes too quickly, and all too soon our last day dawns. The weather is fair, and Cape of Isle is beckoning me. We make an early start, and en route stop at the Temple Cafe for bacon rolls and a cappuccino. Pixie then wants to pay a visit to a little donkey she has befriended. She stands at the fence to its field, waiting for it to come to her. And then these two unlikely friends just regard each other. I have no idea what profundity passes between them. The sea breeze picks up as we leave Norton behind us, and start out across the stretch of Macair that leads towards Cape of Val. Pixie is on her lead, as there are sheep about with young lambs. She has absolutely no interest in them, and in her absent mind, chasing them would be an unjustifiable waste of energy. The day is still currently a bit overcast, but the clouds are backlit by the sun, and some dotted fragments of blue sky are already emerging. We're about halfway along the track when a bird, perhaps a tern, starts hovering in front of us, and then flies further forward, only to stop again and hover until we catch up. It must be nesting close by, and we are being led away from the precious nest site. The imposing bulk of Cape of Al dominates the view ahead, and with each step forward it seems to grow bigger. I can tell Pixie doesn't like what she is seeing, and now her pace slows to a reluctant crawl. At one point amid the last flat green carpet of turf, spotted with spring daisies, she just freezes and looks at the monster monolith looming before her. I can tell Pixie would much rather be in the beach, rolling about in the sands, or wandering around the ancient stones at Callanish, having joyful chance social encounters with other doggies and their humans. To her obvious dismay, I press onwards and try to force the issue, 
I can see several ways to tackle the hill, and I even spot traces of a faint path in places higher up, but mostly the ground looks rough and uncompromisingly steep. As we approach the start of the first big incline, Little Pixie stops again and looks at me, pleading with those beautiful brown eyes of hers. And I know we will not be climbing Cape of Al today, unless I carry her up, which I do briefly consider. Pixie has no enthusiasm for the upward toil involved in this deluded human enterprise. Climbing hills brings her no joy. And finally, I am ready to concede that she will never be a mountain dog like Tashi. We turn away from the hill and contour around it until we join a path that leads to a beautiful beach and the ruins of an old temple. We lunch there and the sun comes out and I spend an hour or so watching the gannets plunging into the sea for fish and Pixie introduces herself to visitors to the temple, hoping to scrounge a tasty titbit from them. Her efforts usually meet with success. She is, after all, an exceptionally cute wee dog. We walk back along the temple beach in warm sunshine. Pixie is in a buoyant mood, being in her happy place and not toiling up that scary hill. I listen to the song of the sea, and the shushing of the sand and surf, and I briefly paddle in the freezing water. Pixie keeps her distance from the incoming tide, and trots along happily at a safe distance from the sea. We make another stop at the temple cafe for a carrot cake and cappuccino, the food in this place is great, and so are the views. And Pixie and I have been regular customers. Scandalously, it even opens on the Sabbath. And this is quite the exception on an island where Sunday observance is still the norm. On our last day, we make a return visit to the sublime sands and magnificent dunes of Scarista. Walking on those white sands and bright spring sunshine is a literally dazzling experience, and the intensity and beauty of the light has me screwing up my eyes. I was hoping to take a little of Tashi and Mum's dust to the summit of Cape of Al, but Pixie has proven herself to be at best a reluctant mountaineer, and particularly after she discovered the joy of being on the beaches of Harris. Close to the incoming tide line, I make a heart shape with some shells, and then place the precious dust of my loved ones in a little hollow in the centre of it. The turquoise waves quickly wash it away as I chant prayers, and nearby Pixie digs a hole in the sand and grunts with absolute satisfaction. Afterwards we retreat to the dunes for a picnic, and while away the afternoon hours, watching lenticular clouds in the azure skies, and listening to the hissing song of the sands driven by the breeze, I find perfect peace on that magnificent beach and I would happily spend my remaining days on this sacred isle. But tomorrow we must return to Glasgow, and it's a long drive for an old boy and his wee pixie girl. Pixie and I made three further visits to Harris. It became our happy place, and we generally enjoyed wonderful weather there. I failed to make a mountain girl of her, but she has turned me into a beach bagger, and we have visited all of those famous beaches of West Harris, and walked them together numerous times. Winter is the only season we have not visited in, 
and I'd love to experience those wild short days. But I doubt Pixie would agree. She finds wind and rain entirely disagreeable. But like all Apsos, she loves the snow. Pixie is eleven now, and she spends most of her time sleeping these days, as older dogs do. I love listening to her yipping and yelping in her dreams, and she does snore like a little foghorn. Pixie is still a very vocal little dog, and sings for her supper, and barks at me for attention, particularly when she wants to show off her paw skills with those little yellow balls of hers. She still enjoys the social side of walking, but I usually take her buggy along on longer walks to spare her old arthritic bones, and she will stand beside her pixie carriage when she's tired and wants to be conveyed like the little Tibetan princess she is. I've grown used to talking to the many strangers she introduces me to every day in the parks of Glasgow, and my small talk has improved with practice. Pixie and I came through the isolation of the global pandemic together, which was a strange time for everyone, and without her companionship, it would have been a very lonely time for this old mountain boy. We are partners now, and have a very strong bond. She definitely regards me as her human servant, and I am happy to serve in that role. The hardest part of sharing your life with a dog is living with the knowledge that they have much shorter lives than us humans and the seasons of life pass much quicker for them. Pixie is sleeping next to me as I write this final chapter on a wet, windy April night in Glasgow, two days after my 64th birthday, and now she will always be alive in this moment, and that is a fitting way to end this my Twa Dogs Mountain Tale.